Hey everybody, how's it going? I am coming to you from beautiful, sunny Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I just came from Jacksonville where my friend who works at iPad Rehab lives. He's a really, really, really talented iPhone data recovery technician, good with long screw damage and all that kind of stuff. I, I hadn't seen him in a while. And I, then now I'm here in Fort Lauderdale. One of the things I was doing before COVID happened is I actually started doing in-person meetups. And I'm thinking I may get that started again while I'm on the road and traveling to different places. I'm going to leave a link down below to the Lewis Rossman Random Live channel because I may announce them there. And you may see them announced in the community page from time to time. Maybe I'll find some place outside has some, where you can get some decent food. And I'll say, I'll be here for an hour. Anybody who wants to come can. I think it may be fun. I, it was something I was doing before COVID, but then COVID happened. But since COVID happened, I got COVID. I beat COVID. I got vaccine number one, I got vaccine number two, and then I made the pilgrimage to Florida. So at this point, I'm pretty sure I'm what the CDC would consider immortal. <laughs> so well, we'll see about that. So a lot of these videos, I often say, you know, and as always, I hope you learn something at the end with all the board repair videos. But now I'm at a point where I could kind of, I honestly kind of need to learn something from all of you. And it's on being a leader because I'm not a particularly good leader and it's something that I'm going to have to learn how to get better at with some of the new initiatives I have. So I have the YouTube channel and I have my store. But recently I opened these two nonprofits, Repair Preservation Group and Repair Preservation Group Action Fund. Repair Preservation Group seek is a 501c3 and it seeks to make repair more accessible, to ensure that it remains accessible, and to make it more viable by teaching repair shops and technicians and do-it-yourselfers alike how to do repairs that they otherwise wouldn't have known how to do. Now, if more people know how to do repairs, more people get involved in it, more people will care about right to repair. Also, if more repair shops are able to say, yes, we can fix that for you, rather than I'm sorry, we can't, or we have to replace the whole board, that means customers will have a better mindset about repair, they'll be more invested in right to repair, they'll support it, because at the point that a technician was able to fix something for them and save them some money, I'm going to walk in the shade over here, they'll, they'll ha be more invested in right to repair than they would be if the shop turned them away. And shops will be less likely to turn people away if there are resources that allow them to tell really quickly whether or not a repair is financially or economically viable or not. And the problem is that there are a lot of repairs, even just like the ones that I posted on my channel, that may not be viable unless you've spent 80 hours with that device. So what I've done with these repair videos is I've tried to make it so that for a lot of these different problems, you don't need to wait 80 hours to doing research on how that board works and how that architecture is put together to be able to fix basic problems like not charging or turning on no image and stuff like that. So I took those 600 videos and with the help of a lot of volunteers at the Open Repair Discord, I turned it into repair.wiki which is really just problem, solution, problem, solution. So that instead of having to spend, you know, 10 hours on something and then realizing it's no fix because you're going to have to spend another 70 to figure out some random issue with it, some, some core failure mode, you can just look at that list and get an idea. This is fixable. This is probably not. And you can take in a device that you may have not been able to take in before. And that's something that I wanted to expand. So Repair Preservation Group, one of the things I wanted to do is kind of create my YouTube channel on steroids. He just caught a worm, and he is happy as a pig and shit with it. He just got a little worm. I love seeing that. But I wanted to make my YouTube channel on steroids there. I wanted to create something that people contributed solutions to in a similar manner to what I have at Repair.Wiki uh, for MacBooks. The reason for this is one of the things that stops repair shops and repair people from being able to do a job is uncertainty as to what the flaw is. It may be fixable, it's just maybe one of those needle in a haystack things where it takes 50 or 80 hours to figure out if it's fixable. And if a device is worth 500 bucks, you, you can't put that amount of time in. However, if some other nut job like me has stayed up until four in the morning for you know, nights on end, or people like Duke from the Netherlands, or Volley from the Forum, or you know, Mark Schaefer, or Tim Herman, or Jessa Jones, or any of these people, uh, if you, we figure out that solution and then we, we all post them, that means that less of us spend 80 hours trying to figure out a particular problem and a solution, meaning that we will be able to offer more repairs to customers. We'll be able to make more money because we'll be able to do more repairs. Customers will be able to save more money because they'll, they'll get turned down from repair shops less often because there'll be more resources on how to do repairs that otherwise would not be attempted. 
And with this YouTube channel, I've taken a lot of repairs that people said, you did, that, that's, that's junk, you gotta throw that away. There's no fixing that. And I show you how to do it, and I make it as easy as one, two, three. But the reason I'm able to put that into an eight minute video and make it look easy is because I spent, I stayed up until three or four in the morning for years of my life trying to figure all this stuff out to make it look easy. Now, here was what I wanted to do. With Repair Preservation Group, which is separately funded from Repair Preservation Group Action Fund, just want to make that distinction, I wanted to be able to go up to the technicians who are best in class in this field and ask them, how much money would it take? Or what would it re be required for you to be open to contributing to this? So when you fix something and you do some sort of difficult repair, when you figure out that solution, for you to post them you know, on an ad hoc basis, so every time you have one, Every time you find us a new solution, you post it here to this wiki on a page for it. What would, it, what would make that worth it to you financially to do that? To instead of just keep that solution, you had to post it here. And so far, I've gotten some people who've said, I'll get back to you, some people that said no, and a lot of people that just kind of ignored me and haven't gotten back at all. And I think the problem here is that I haven't been able to project my vision for this to everybody. So a lot of people in this business have the idea that if you share information on how to do a repair that you know how to do, that someone else doesn't know how to do, that this is a doggy dog world. That there is one hot dog on the table and you either have the choice of eating the hot dog, sharing it, meaning you get half the hot dog, or you know, not getting any hot dog at all and then you're, you're hungry all day because you're starving because somebody else ate your hot dog. Whereas I kind of see it the way Eli the computer guy sees it. I try to increase the size of the pie rather than increase my share of the pie. I'm not looking to increase my, how, you know, the, the share of the pie that I get. I want to increase the size of the pie altogether so that more people get to have pie. And if the pie gets bigger, more, not only do more people get to have pie, but my, my size can, gets larger as well. So my thought is this. If, oh my God, that is a giant lizard. Jesus, did you see that? Whoa. Oh, he ran away. I don't know if you guys could see that. Holy shit. Lizard. Where'd you go? Where'd you go, lizard? There was a, look at that thing. Jesus Christ. What is this, Jurassic Park? I am not in New York anymore. Anyway, that is so cool. That was awesome. I just saw a giant lizard walking while I was doing a video. That's crazy. I love it. I love Florida. I really do. So my idea is, let's say you did 80 hours of research to figure out that one solution and that allows you to make money because other people don't know how to do that job. Somebody else probably put in 80 hours of research to figure out how to do a repair as well that you don't know how to do. So if everybody posts things, yeah, more people will be able to do the repair that only you knew how to do for a short period of time, but you'll now know how to do repairs that nobody else knew how to do before. You'll, you'll learn how to do their repairs, they'll learn how to do your repairs, and everybody all together is going to be able to make more money because everybody's going to turn down less work, everybody's going to have less no fixes because everybody's going to have more information. That was my vision. So even if you lose out on a repair that only you knew how to do, and now somebody else down the block knows how to do the same thing, if everybody contributes to this, then everybody will collectively be better off. But it's one of those tragedy of the commons things where everybody kind of wants to, every, no, I shouldn't say tragedy of the commons, that's the wrong way to put it. It's one of those things where everybody believes that if they're the only one to do it, then they're the sucker and they lose out. Even if I've actually offered financial compensation for providing solutions to kind of get the ball rolling. And I've really, really failed really hardcore over the past few months at figuring out how to incentivize and motivate the people who are at the top of their field in whatever particular sect of repair it is to want to contribute what makes their business run well to this guide. Now, my vision at the end of the day isn't even just about your shop making more money. It's if, if repair of a wider array of devices is made more economically viable if board repair of a wider array of devices is made more economically viable, 
that customers will be turned, instead of having to go to the one place that knows which chip on the LG G8 goes bad when it starts boot looping, or goes to the one place that knows how to fix an 820-3332 2012 MacBook that has GPU issues, that if everybody knows how to do it, then that customer is going to be turned away less because the likelihood that they're going to find the one place that knows how to do it rather than go to two to three places that say no fix and then say I'm chucking this, it's pretty low. If they can go, if, if they're able to, on the first time, the first place they go to, get a repair, that customer is more likely to have a better opinion of repair. They're more likely to have a better opinion of the repair industry. And that makes them an advocate for this. And we need normal, average, everyday people to be advocates for repair. It's important. One of the things I aim to do with this YouTube channel in the beginning is kind of humanize the entire craft. Because when I started doing this, people that I met, they viewed repair people as these shady, they, these shady mechanics that just want to screw you out of money and always screw you and take your, and like, you know, they're, they're going to take your stuff into a back room and tell you that stuff's wrong with it that's not really wrong with it. So I wanted to add a human element to what I was doing. I wanted to add a human element and uh, really get people to understand what it's like to be on my side of the desk, on my side of the microscope, to realize that, okay, yeah, we're not perfect, but we're human beings that do our best and that really do care about doing a good job and care about our customers. And that's been crucial. That's been key to getting people to support repair, support right to repair, ask for, you know, actually listen to us when we say, here's how companies are trying to destroy property rights by taking away your ability to fix your own stuff. And I think that if we're able to make repair better all around by creating resources so that this information is not hiding in a password protected Polish or Russian forum or something, or on some IRC channel somewhere, but really out there where everybody can find it, that more people that go to these places will have better experiences. The problem continues to exist that in our industry there is a thought, a misconception, that if you share information on how to do a repair that you know how to do with somebody else, they'll start doing it. And that there's this pool of like 10 customers, right? There's only 10 people that ever needed a repair. And if your competitor knows how to do it, now instead of getting 10 customers, you'll only get five. And if you have, if you have 10 competitors, and now they all know how to do this job, there's only 10 customers out there in the world, so now you're only gonna get one repair. You're screwed. And it's really strange, because I would have thought that with the YouTube channel that I have, that I would have disproven this. I thought that once, I got to the point where I've created 600 videos that really just put out there every single thing that I know how to do. And then I catalog it on a website that is easy to view in flashcard format. If I could do all of that, and my business could go from three employees to 13 or 14 employees, that maybe people would stop believing that if they shared how to do what they do, that they would go out of business, that they would be financially punished for it. Yet it is still the default for most people to believe that they will be financially punished for demonstrating how to do repair to other people. Because then other businesses will know, and that's my secret. My secret is how I make my money. I have yet to be a good enough leader to be able to advocate for my vision. And because of that, I have a wiki that at this point in time, 99% of the solutions there are from me. I have yet to convince any of the top people in this field that it would be worth their time, even for money, to contribute. And I've reached out to some people that make videos similar to mine, and I've reached out to some people that I know to be uh, best in class in this industry, and I've tried to kind of try, you know, coax the works and say, I see you post on these forums. You know what you're talking about. And when you do a repair, can you say, problem, solution, enter it into this thing, and then do that enough times that, you know, actually, so, so I can justify giving you some money to do this. And I've really failed in my sales pitch there. I have genuinely failed. And I think a big part of it is a problem of leadership, my leadership, and also my inability to get across my vision to other people. And that's something that I'm going to have to get better at. Now, oh God, it's a giant lizard again. Holy mother... You know what I'm going to do? I'm gonna, when I meet these people, I'm just going to take a lizard like that and toss it right on their back, and I bet they'll 
they'll listen to me then. They'll start posting stuff. Oh my God, look at him. Look at him go. It's a lizard. It's a giant lizard. Wow. It's probably going to be a while before I stop being shocked by seeing those things, but it's so cool. It's so cool. I love Florida. It's awesome. It's my own failure as a leader that's gotten me to a point where a few months in and I really haven't made any progress here. So I'm very curious if you guys, maybe I could learn something from you. Leave something in the comments. Let me know what you think. Where am I going wrong here? When contacting people who I believe to be at the top of their field, what should I do differently? How, what, what approach should I take? I'm also debating if the proper thing to do is not necessarily having the text themselves do it, but rather making an index of the best places on the web to find this information or the private forums and finding the posts from the people that are the smartest on those who make all the good solutions and then finding people who are less technically inclined, I mean, somewhat technically inclined, but not geniuses in repair, and then having them just scrub their post history and post all those solutions here. And then instead of paying the person who makes the solution, paying the person whose job it is to scrub through their 3,000 forum posts on some private Polish forum, and then take all that stuff and put it into a problem solutions database. But my goal is that someone else who enters this business does not have to stay up until three or four in the morning every day for months and months on end like I did to figure out what the core problems are. When a new iPhone comes out and there's a new core problem, like it's taking 60 milliamps and not booting, Jessa will stay, you know, she'll go to work and she'll stay there until 3 a.m. for weeks, sometimes months, and stay away from her kids and everything to do this. And it's like, okay, some of it is fun. When you finally figure it out, it's fun. But at the same time, sometimes when a device comes in with that problem, it would be really nice if that information was just out there and available. And for a lot of other ind repair industries, for a lot of other devices, that information is out there. It's in manuals, it's, on, it's in centralized resources, but for our industry, it's not. And I want to start getting that stuff out there because it would make this a much more viable industry. And I'm at a point with the 501c3 where there are funds in the bank to fund this. But one of the things that I learned from my supply company uh, many years ago is that money doesn't solve problems. It can, money kind of creates more of them. Because once you have money, you can no longer say, well, if I had money, I'd do this, that, or the other. Once you have money, then it's, okay, you have money, but you haven't actually gotten it done yet. Now you don't have an excuse anymore. And I, that's where I am with this 501c3. And I want to be clear here with the 501c3 and 501c4. I don't intend to compensate myself a salary. I will not be paying myself a dime from either of these organizations. The money from both of these organizations is going to be used for their, you know, for both, uh, toward, going towards both of their goals. But I do want to make sure that, I guess as time goes on, I, can, um, I figure out how to become a bit of a better leader so that I can get my vision across better. Because I think if I get my vision across better, I'll have more buy-in than I do right now. You know, I realized how I was really very, very close to, you know, when I was at the three or four employee threshold to kind of bombing it and going back down a one or just failing altogether. It's real easy to fail. You know, you, put in, you stay up until two or four in the morning for a long enough time trying to figure out solutions. And, you know, if you don't figure them out, then you're, you're done. You're out of business. And I, I want to, the path that I walked to be made easier for the next generation. I'm trying to figure out how I can make the path that I walked easier to be walked for the next generation. Because if the next generation spends less time staying up until four in the morning to try to figure out solutions when new devices come out, maybe they can spend more time building their businesses, satisfying their customers, or figuring out other solutions. There could be so many solutions out there that we're not figuring out because repair shop over there is, is spending all day trying to figure out a solution that repair shop over there already figured out. But the repair shop over there is spending all day trying to fix another device that they already figured out how to fix you know, two months ago. And they don't even know because they're both hiding the solutions from each other because the repair shop over there thinks that if they hide their solution from repair shop over there, that they'll make more money. And that repair shop thinks if they hide their solution from that one, they'll make more money. Whereas in reality, if they both traded their solutions, they'd make double the money and spend half the time. 
And the thing that's really interesting is I'm so bad when it comes to leadership, when it comes to, to explaining my vision, I can't even convince people in the repair industry who are my own friends of this, much less people that I haven't met. So it's something that I'm doing wrong, and it's something I'm going to need to get better at. And I don't really know where to start. So this channel just kind of started with me just, you know, talking into my camera about whatever I thought at the time. So I figured, here, I'll walk around Fort Lauderdale a little bit, explain my problem, and see what you all have to say about it. This also uh, has to do with when I post those links to how you can contact a senator or an assembly person or something when, uh, when there's a bill that's up for vote in a particular state or when there's a Senate hearing that's going to be in a particular state. Uh, well, I see the views that the video gets and then I see the engagement from it. I'll see 130,000 views and I'll see that 20 people emailed. I'll know out of 130,000 people that more than 20 people that watch that video, let's say, live in Nebraska or Montana or New York. Like, there'll be more. I know that. So I'm not, I'm not able to break past the general cynicism that people have when it comes to contacting their elected officials. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, walk here and say that you don't have reason to be cynical about dealing with your elected officials. You could go on for hours and hours about how they waste time, resources, pander, and don't get things done. But when you get, you know, 30,000 people to contact versus 5 or 20, you do tend to get a different reaction out of them. And if I'm going to be successful with some of the lobbying initiatives, yeah, you know, hiring lobbyists in the states where there are right to repair bills, that's going to go a long way towards getting us somewhere. And that's something that over the next few months I'm going to be putting a lot of time and effort into. Nice car. But at the same time, I'm going to have to figure out how to actually start rallying people to actually do these calls to action that I haven't, I haven't been very successful with so far. How do you think I can get my vision across to people better? How do you think that I can motivate people better to understand and see my vision the way that I see my vision? And how do you think, even if they disagree with my vision, I could get them to propose to me alternates that could accomplish something similar? And that's a giant duck just walking around. Is that a duck, a goose, or... Man, I went to public school. They don't teach very well there. Look at this. That is a giant... What's up, buddy? How's it going? Whoa, there's another one. And right over there, there were lizards. This is crazy. This is absolute insanity. Look at this. He's not even scared of me. He's just like, I don't give a crap. I'll mess you up. Like in New York, the pigeons run away from you. But here, look at this guy. He doesn't care that I'm over here. It's like I'm walking here. Absolute insanity. I may also wind up announcing some sort of meetups on the community page soon. Just for fun. All right, I'm going to get going. I'll see you all later. That's it for today. And hopefully I can learn something from all of you. Because most of you are smarter than me. Bye-bye.